See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. Welcome to See You Now. I'm your host, Shauna Butler. My name is Bree Laughlin. I've been a nurse for 22 years. I've gone from kidney and liver transplant and med surge to organizational strategy and design and change management consulting, to informatics, to entrepreneurship. And I am now the CEO of Nurse Disrupted. Nurse Disrupted is a nurse-led tech company that was formed in response to COVID-19. I'm Tracy Zvenich. I've been in nursing for 17 years. For over a decade, I've sat in the circles of health policy, going from the United States Senate to running a policy portfolio at a Fortune 500 pharmaceutical company. The story goes, March the 23rd, found out the need from Porchlight, an adult male homeless shelter. There needed to be screening. The answer was virtual screening with tablets. The first person I call is Tracy. Our program's improving access to care and the quality of care. While we're only addressing COVID right now, mm -hmm. it's meaningful in that way and also an opportunity to improve healthcare and healthcare delivery. This is See You Now. Innovation is often associated with a high tech advancement, a sleek, miniaturized device, or a radically new way of automating a task, and frequently is accompanied by long development timelines and sizable budgets. But sometimes, innovation, ones that are system changing, that are life changing, those that solve really complex problems are those that embrace simplicity, are ridiculously usable and implemented swiftly. Take for example, the challenge of caring for our homeless population during a pandemic, a population that vastly increased due to COVID and the ensuing economic crisis. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of people experiencing homelessness in the U.S. was trending upwards with estimates of over a half a million people living without stable housing and regularly seeking services from a patchwork of homeless shelters. Seeing the need to keep homeless shelters and their guests and staff safe and free of the coronavirus, Nurse Disrupted, a pandemic response startup in Madison, Wisconsin, was launched in record time to build fast, simple, virtual health screenings for the homeless community. In this episode, we meet nurses Bree Laughlin and Tracy Zvenich, co-founders of Nurse Disrupted, and dig deep into the details of launching their new venture. We get their take on innovation and what's required to go from idea to impact, learn how their vastly different but highly complementary backgrounds are a strength of their partnership and how in working to solve one problem they simultaneously solved several more when i read through and think about all the different things that you are involved with it is just breathtaking and exciting and the fact that you have this commitment to the profession to the workforce itself, it comes at a time, boy, we, we need this in a way that we have not needed it before. But one of the things that I wanted to start out with, um, and I'll st start with you, Tracy, I want to talk about innovation. How do you define innovation? I think I think about innovation as how can we do things differently? How do we think about them differently? And then how do we actually do them differently? I really believe that it's hard to do innovation alone. And that has been my experience in the policy circles for well over a decade of, you know, making sure that we as nurses are part of that conversation and we have a seat at the table, because if you don't have a seat at the table, then you don't get to provide that expertise and those insights that really do shape how we get things done and how we improve access and quality of healthcare. And advocacy is just a passion and a, and a vehicle to do that. Spending more and more time in this space, what I find is that nurses advocate for 
a set of problems that I think have remained invisible, difficult to look at, hard to work with. And if we're not in those decisive conversations, many of these topics never rise to even a consideration. So, um, Bree, I think a lot of people, they equate technology and innovation. They don't necessarily equate innovation with policy. You definitely go over into the technology side. When you think about innovation, how do you define it? What's your philosophy? Yeah, and I love this question, Shauna, because I think it illustrates the, the power of the partnership that Tracy and I have. For me, innovation is problem solving. And the, the way that I go about it can make people very uncomfortable. I'm very bad at, at accepting um, no or that something is not possible. When you say it's not possible, that, that's my starting point. So Tracy puts people together. I come in and I'm like, problem, fastest way to solve it. I have this creative mind. You know, I was just, <laughs> I was talking to some folks about leadership at University of Washington the other week. And I'm like, leadership for some is maintaining order. But leadership is a homonym. It also is getting everyone to move in a common direction. So the way I go about innovation is, here's my problem. What's the fastest solution? And it may be very unconventional, right? It might be sticking a tablet on a stick and saying, we can do this in a couple of hours. Or bending a software program and saying, well, it was designed to do this, but it does this very well. And now I just have to implement it and also get to yes. <laughs> so it's one thing to have an idea and say, I, I know it's good and I know it's right. Mm -hmm. But the best technology in the world, if it's not implemented, is useless. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm laughing because the two of you embody, in some ways, an, an inherent tension between technology and policy. Mm -hmm. They don't always run at the same pace. They have to be partners in this. The technology is what drives things forward. It creates new possibilities. It creates value, you know, can, hopefully. And the policy side is making sure that there's a degree of equity or fairness and safety. And the tension oftentimes that the technology folks bring is, let's do something we've never done before. <laughs> the innovation piece, or let's experiment with this. And the policy folks are, hang on you know but also I've, I've also seen policy folks that are very forward thinking that put something in place that say this is the aspiration this is the problem that we're trying to solve let's put a policy in place and the technology and the innovators come in and say okay so now you've put the guardrails around this now you've defined you know how we can safely play fairly play who gets to play go for it so i find your partnership incredibly fascinating and I, I'm so impressed at how you two have made such great friends in a place oftentimes that we see an antagonistic relationship. All right, so let's go back to March of 2020. And what's the conversation that says, we got a problem. What are we going to do to solve it? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a lot of talking. So the third week of March, I was supposed to go back to Seattle to see my family with my nine-year-old daughter and, and my husband and the pandemic had started, it's not gonna put us on plan. Clementine is my daughter and we've had a commitment since she was tiny to our homeless populations. Um, and I wanna be very clear that people don't choose homelessness. People, um, when we look at the statistics for people who have lost their home or stable housing, you know, these are our veterans. These disproportionately are people with chronic disease. These are very important humans. And so I was like, it's spring break. We can't go to Seattle. Let's do something meaningful. We saw a social media post from Carla Tennis, the executive director of Porchlight, which is an adult male homeless shelter in Madison. The first post that I saw was that they needed cash cards and small denominations for families. So Clementine and I went and got the cash cards and went to the shelter. But what, what we found as I started a dialogue with Carla is they needed screening. So in March in Madison, the Department of Health had put together protocols. The state had come together and put together resources for the shelter. There was a, a trailer um, so that symptomatic guests to the shelter could be taken aside. Um, but there was this big gap in the center. And it's that there were three screening questions in March. You know, do you have a, a fever, chills, a sore throat, or a newer worsening cough? 
And there are volunteers, these incredible people that didn't have medical backgrounds that just volunteered to say, I will ask these questions. And there's, I almost said there was a lot of fear. There is still so much fear when we ask people these questions. They are frightened to say that they don't feel well. There's stigma. There's concern. Will I get a bed? Will I get a meal? Will I be okay? Will the other people around here have a problem with me being here because I have a symptom? So the, the state protocol is then to call the, the person's primary care provider. Well, homeless but, folks. You know, 530, <laughs> it's 530 at night and, and, you know, these people don't have a home, let alone a primary care provider. And so what happened was many of the guests, if they did have one of the three symptoms, would be diverted to the emergency departments. The emergency departments push back. Um, there's a volume of them going there, and they're really not set up for this. There's a list of phone numbers to call. They were nurse triage lines, but those nurse triage lines were set up for clinics with physicians who were reimbursed for people that they were the PCPs for, and, and there was pushback there. Yeah, so, so it's interesting to hear how you've identified the set of instructions, the protocol that state health departments have put together and are recommending, it's a, it leads basically to a dead end or to creating another problem. Yes. yes. There, was, there was no way to implement the protocols. Okay, so March 23rd, Carla Tenas put out social media this need. I'm like, I'm a nurse, <laughs> you know, I can do screening. And I came home, my husband's very supportive, and I said, hey, I need to do this. And normally he'd be like, yeah, you do. But I had been very, very sick early March. I was in bed for 10 days, and he was like, are you sure you were in bed? Everyone asked me if I have COVID. I do not know. In March, the recommendations were, if you are not feeling well, not to go test. There weren't mass testing centers. It was write it out unless you're really bad. And so I, I don't know, but I was very sick. I was like, okay, but I can still help and I can help virtually. And so I was like, yeah, we can put up a couple of tablets, a MiFi. I've got this incredible network of nurses. We know how to use the protocol, which was written by the Department of Health, apply the protocol and virtually screen the people who need them and have clinical screening in place. And again, innovators around you. Like I call Tracy, Tracy's like, let's figure liability out. Great, we'll get the wheels turning. Carla didn't skip a beat. So first from idea to go live was 48 hours. That night though, March 23rd, we had our Wisconsin Nurses Association COVID-19 response meeting. So idea happened, Carla gave the green light to do virtual screening by nurses. We had our COVID-19 response meeting for Wisconsin Nurses Association. And I said, hey, I want, I, I'm gonna do this with Porchlight. And you get a bunch of other problem solvers, one of them being Kim Woodless, an associate dean for Marion University School of Nursing. And she had doctoral students who were not going to graduate because with the pandemic, their practicum sites had closed down. One of them was less than 10 hours from graduating. And she wasn't going to graduate at the time that we needed nurses because she was 10 hours short of our practicum hours. And Kim said, can you provide practicum hours for nurses. And I always say the bags in my eyes got twice as big. And I, you know, it's like, I'm already doing something impossible, but how can you say no? And with the tablets, with virtual care, we can get nurses to where they couldn't physically be. And we save PPE. PPE was a big problem, right? No, no N95 masks, you know, how are you going to protect yourself? So you have virtual clinical intervention and Marion University is an hour and a half north of Madison, which is where the shelter was, but we could connect these nursing students with the people who needed the care because of the virtual medium. Yeah, the academic partnerships really, really scaled up from there. We quickly found out that schools of nursing across the state were facing clinical site closures or major reductions in hours. So we started serving as a clinical site. We now have six academic partnerships with nursing schools across the state. We have supported over 100 nursing students, 104 nursing students. That has amounted to almost 700 hours of clinical and practicum hours that are helping them meet their graduation requirements. So we're going to continue to grow our academic partnerships because it's it's absolutely, it's a win-win for for us in supporting the homeless community. It's a win for the students to get the graduation hours that they need. And it's also 
a win for us because we are so dedicated to the future of the nursing workforce. It's something that Brie and I are both incredibly passionate about. And we get to introduce people to homeless people in a place where they are safe. So many of these students had not had contact with our homeless populations before. And this provided an environment where they could connect. We do compassion teaching with technology. I think it's the special sauce of technology. There's a few things. We're on Zoom. We have a technical literacy level that's higher than the general U.S. public. We had to serve people who were more like the 69% of the U.S. population that doesn't have the tech literacy or access to technology to really benefit from it in this way. So we had to create very simplified technology. The tablet, somebody simply walks up. The nurse is on the other side. At one time on those tablets, I had four buttons and four buttons only. It was three buttons too many. Now I have a large target 10 inch tablet. It says tap here for a nurse. You tap here for a nurse. But you can't deliver on the promise of technology if people cannot use it. Same thing for our nursing students. We teach them connecting with people through the camera. Nurses need to learn how to use the technology in a way that puts the human back into the technology. Like I said, people are frightened and it's not just the people being screened, but it's also the people working in these organizations. I mean, they're on the front line as well. And we get a lot of questions that nurses, it is our science, it is our discipline to educate, to instill calm and trust, and to apply evidence-based science in a way that people accept. There's a lot of disbelief right now. And God, Tracy, you and I were just talking about this the other day. It's like we're educators, but it's like people will only accept what they believe. It's got to be delivered in a way that people will make their own and adopt. We do with the education, your mask, it needs to be above your nose, below your chin. You need to wash your hands with a hand sanitizer. We show them how it sounds silly, but it's like hand washing isn't any good unless you create that friction. Same thing with your hand sanitizer. And then showing people what six feet apart is. And then we see with that day-to-day education, the compassionate application of science through a technology medium, a high adoption rate of practices that people in the U.S. have really had a hard time, especially in Wisconsin, when you look at our numbers adopting. So the human part is the special sauce. Great opportunities, right? Great (laughs) teaching moments. Always, always teaching moments. So anyway, so they're going through um, this line and You've made the distinction whether or not they need to have additional further screening. Yep. Yep. At this location, that's, that's the way it works. And so they'll come to the trailer and the tablet is there on a stick. The guest simply approaches it and they have a nurse prepared to do in-depth screening. I mean, the first thing you're doing is using your clinical observation, right? And, and they're prompted, of course, if somebody comes up and they are just not looking good, they're struggling to breathe, they're not mentating, they're not walking appropriately, this assessment is done. And you can see them because of the video-based technology, right? But then it's, do you have a fever or chills, runny nose, cough, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of your sense of taste or smell? If the answer is yes to the magic 11, then we look for chronicity right? Headache is one of the symptoms. Well, the important thing is you can have somebody who has chronic migraines. And so the clinical assessment goes into the chronicity of the symptoms that are being experienced. So I did create also a clinical decision support tool with branching logic, just light. Again, easy to use our nurses. We have them trained within three hours. That means every piece of technology also that they touch must be intuitive and simple. And so the branching logic tool that I created, again, helps walk them through the assessment steps, and then it lands them on the correct of the three options, that the guests can go back to the shelter, that they need to go to the hotel voucher program and what that means, or that they need to be referred to the ED. And you you mentioned that there was so much fear and this worry of, if I tell somebody that I'm having symptoms, that means I may not have a bed or a meal this evening. So how are you addressing making sure that um, people feel safe to give you the information and knowing that by coming to you, they are going to be served. They are going to be cared for. That was a big part of our nurse volunteer training. 
and it's built into the clinical decision support tool as well. The scripting for the nurse with the protocol is you will not lose your bed tonight. We are making sure that you will have a place and you will have a meal. And so it is part of our training and it's a dialogue that's put in our clinical decision support tool to enforce that. The other thing too is, I mean, this is a, a big part of the future of nursing, whether we call it video nursing or virtual nursing or the new term we're gonna come up with. We're also training nurses to use the technology. It's so different than in-person nursing and to embrace not only the concept of machine speeds and internet speeds make a difference in your ability to deliver care, but to understand that when you're on shift, it's exactly like being in a clinic. You wouldn't show up to your clinic in pajamas <laughs> in front of the TV with low light. When you come to your virtual space, you are in your clinic, you're in a professional setting, you look like a professional, and you are prepared to be there for people and that you, again, fall back on your training and the science. We reinforce our training, we have weekly newsletters. It's a combination of, of this new medium, but with very classic nurse science training and intervention. We do, however, as soon as we can get a breath post pandemic, absolutely want to keep these places wired and start focusing on chronic disease management and mental health crisis intervention. And I know Tracy can speak to this. We have conducted over 10,500 screenings across our shelter sites. We were able to keep the shelters outbreak free for seven months. Mm. Uh, one of our shelters is approaching nine months without an outbreak. And we're also seeing that our program's improving access to care and, and quality of care. We're conducting a survey at the men's shelter at Porchlight. And out of the early responses that we have in on those surveys, a vast majority of the respondents say that our program is increasing their access to care. While we're only addressing COVID right now, mm -hmm. it's a real, it's meaningful in that way and also an opportunity to improve healthcare and healthcare delivery, specifically for the homeless community and this vulnerable population. And there's just tremendous opportunity to, to do so much more uh, as we go forward. So Bree was describing the multitude of questions running through her head in these 48 hours. I would imagine you've got a different set of concerns running through your head and specific, you know, the, from the policy perspective, what were, what were your main concerns? Wait, can we pause for a moment? Cause I don't want to lose this opportunity as Tracy just talked about numbers. Nurses know, and maybe our non-nursing people don't know that the science of nursing has to do with data and analytics. And from day one, we talked about capturing data electronically. Why? So that we would have access to these numbers. We're looking at our homeless shelters, our K through 12 schools, they are on paper. They don't have the data that we need to get past this pandemic. Tracy and I have never thought about doing this any other way, but making sure that the data was collected, the volume of data, it's got to be done electronically so that you have that transparency and, and so that we can make a difference. It's, it's in a really important part of the story. And when we think back to the very first uh, nurse informaticist and data scientist, uh, people don't understand or appreciate Florence Nightingale's expertise as a statistician yeah. and her ability to impact at the policy level was because she had not only the data, but she had the data story and her ability to visualize it. Yeah. So those things all do map in. And I'm, I can only imagine that, Tracy, over there with your policy mind, you first go to, we've got to have the data, we've got to have the numbers, because solving this for this particular homeless shelter is just solving it for this particular homeless shelter. It's yeah. not until you take it up to a policy level that you have a sweeping change and impact. So yeah, that was, thank you for interjecting that and reminding that that was a big piece of your foundational thought process. It wasn't, we've got a group of 40 men standing outside in the cold. What do we do for them? It's, we have 40 men standing outside of the cold all over the world who need this. So, so yeah, I'll go back to that, that question, Tracy, that what's going through your head from a policy perspective? What were your concerns that needed to be baked into this at the foundational level? Yeah, the, the data is super important. 
The data that we collect during each and every screening gives us information in our communications with pu the public health department. We use our data when we talk to public health. Our data is sometimes more sophisticated than the public health department's data that, that they're collecting in their, in their systems at times. So the data is super important and it does strengthen and inform our discussions as we want to change policy in this space. Access to care policies for homeless populations, there are several barriers and limitations in that area. The lack of funding for care to vulnerable populations, of the funding to shelter organizations who are providing services. So, you know, we have developed relationships or in, are in communication with the, um, the state officials that run the programming for the homeless shelter community. Oftentimes in the policy world, you know, reimbursement is where the rubber hits the road. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of conversations about, well, how are the CARES Act funding get, being allocated and distributed? How can we use our services to support the shelter community that need them and that have some access to, to some of those funds? Let's talk about your career paths and the different destinations and stops that have been along the way because I think it really represents a portfolio of activities. So Bree, do you want to go first on that one? Sure. Um, I graduated from uh, nursing school 20 years ago. I started at Virginia Mason as a nursing assistant, finished my degree, my bachelor's at University of Washington, went into kidney liver transplant and was a frontline nurse who was always, always a tech nerd. Even on the front line in the nine, you know, in the nineties, in my Palm Pilot, um, and believed that there, there was. You were the way. only nurse there with a the Palm. I know, <laughs> I know, I know. But you think, you know, we know the trajectory of electronic yeah. health records, right? Like yeah. in the early two thousands. I mean, we only really saw the adoption go from what is it, like three percent to, you know, the the eighty some percent that it is in the past ten years. So, believing that that we could elevate the practice of nursing through technology is something that was infused in my practice early on. I just loved it. And I want to say in 2008, I was ambitious, looking to advance my career. And so I interviewed for two positions. One was with my friend's tech startup, had nothing to do with healthcare. And one was as a transplant coordinator. I chose to work for the, for the startup company. That's how I got solidly into software. A lot of people ask, you know, you, well, you know, you, you had this branch in your career and it's like, actually, you didn't know it, but you were taking business classes in nursing school. Like the nursing process is actually a business process. Anytime you go into an emergency situation, you do a sweep, you're analyzing the situation, you have emotional intelligence and you're able to put people together. So the transition that I had to software company was actually more natural than anyone expected. And I was offered a position with Center Health in Northern California. And by that time, my software and consulting part of my career was absolutely infused with my nursing part of my career. That's when I became a nursing informaticist. I was still seeing patients at Sutter Health in a cardiology clinic, but I had a swath of cardiologists who did not want to use technology. They were either going to retire or we were going to get you were going to kill them. You were going to take them out with technology. And I was like, hey, you know, I just spent all this time doing change management, you know, um, and, and so. That's a different type of change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also, you know, technology, again, it, you know, it, it has to be simpler. There has to be a why. Like, you can't just deploy technologies because it's cool or because somebody thinks it should be done, or simply because it's available. You know, a couple of the reasons why we actually do that, because it's cool. Yeah. Because we can. Oh, yeah. Because somebody said we might need it. I have yeah, seen totally. those. Yeah, I have seen those implementations yeah. on many occasions. Like, this is the coolest they weren't thing I've ever problem. seen. Exactly. This is so neat. And it's like, what does it do? It's like, oh. <laughs> you know, it's beautiful. And it's like, I am taking care of people who need something. Um, I call it a gum wall. Software design, you know, especially when there's just a lot of, of pretty things on it, when you stick a bunch of goo on there, it becomes pointless. And so, you know, Tracy and I, Tracy came up with our, our tagline, massive compassion through simple technologies. We are relentlessly committed to the simplest technology that has the biggest impact. 
So in 2012, I had an offer to join Epic's clinical informatics team. So that's a, a clinical team, very excited to work uh, with Judy Faulkner, very powerful leader. And I was able to design and manage five products over the eight and a half years that I was there. I was committed to simplification for nursing, designed a product called LDA Avatar, converting text-based documentation to visual-based documentation. It's something I really had to fight for. It was a lot of work. It wasn't the way people were thinking. Um, but for nurses, it was like, make it visual, make it simple, um, you know, and something, something I'm proud of. But when the pandemic hit, my nursing career took uh, another turn, and that's that there, there's a huge need. I mean, COVID-19 response, this is nursing. Um, and the way that I could fill a gap had to do with nursing technology. And so um, now for, you know, how many bends I've taken in my career, now it's as, you know, a CEO for Nurse Disrupted, our technology, nursing, and innovation startup company. And yeah, Sean, I think everything that I've done for the past 22 years has put me into a position to do something like this. I could see the problem, I could see the solution, you know, and it's a culmination of 22 years of nursing, technology, innovation that, that made the path clear. Yeah, I, Tracy, let's, so you, you have also this really interesting path, uh, a career that has a lot of also different stops and destinations, dramatically different and entirely complementary to Brie. Share, please. Sure. I always knew I wanted to be a nurse. So I was inspired by my grandmother who was a nurse in the 30s. And um, I I never went off course. I always kept that as my my destination. However, in in nursing school, I was intrigued by a lot of the classes and topics that other people um, were not as interested in, like my health systems class and my uh, policy class. And I, I remember realizing as a as a you know a college student thinking how well, Medicare and Medicaid actually are really important. Um, Ever the outlier here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had early signals in my nursing education that I probably wasn't going to go a traditional nursing path. I didn't know it at the time, but there were some early indicators. So I did go and work in a trauma ICU right out of nursing school. I quickly applied for graduate school and went into a graduate a uh, nurse or an adult nurse practitioner program within a couple of years of getting my my bachelor's completed graduate school and worked as a nurse practitioner for a couple of years. I will say that as when I was working as a trauma ICU nurse, I every day I went to work, I kept thinking people are so sick. Why are mm -hmm. people so sick? I want to improve the health of people. And that was a driving force for me going to uh, get my master's to be adult nurse practitioner and focus on primary care, thinking if I can work upstream, work on the chronic disease management, prevent people from getting so sick, that, that's, where, that's where I'm going to find my sweet spot. And then as working as a nurse practitioner, caring for and treating patients with chronic disease and acute illness as well, I very quickly realized that the system was broken. And then I couldn't get patients the care that they needed and access to the care that they needed was really challenging. So oftentimes in the clinic, I felt like I was banging my head against the wall trying to get people the care that they needed. So I got more involved in advocacy and policy. And um, in 2008, I had the opportunity to uh, move to D.C. And I made an entire career change. I said, I'm going to give policy a try. It was a perfect storm where the beginning of the Affordable Care Act debates were starting. And I met people, I networked, and I was able to work on Capitol Hill. I worked for a United States Senator for about four years and worked during the Affordable Care Act debate. I was a health staffer during the Affordable Care Act. I'm very proud of those years. I stayed on for a couple of years after the Affordable Care Act. I worked on everything from women's policy to workforce policy to judiciary to immigration policy in advising the senator. It was a, it was a tremendous experience. And then I left uh, working for the senator on Capitol Hill to start my PhD in health policy. 
and got a call during that graduate program and was recruited to lead a policy portfolio at a pharmaceutical company. So I did that for seven years after the Hill. I also have uh, the great privilege of teaching health policy and advocacy at Georgetown University to graduate level nursing students. Um, I think that uh, nursing expertise and training is really, um, it's a really powerful combination in the policy world because <laughs> like technology, it is prob problem solving. And it also is it's a high stress environment. High stress and high stakes. Yeah, yeah. And also the advocacy comes natural, I think, to nurses because we advocate for our patients every day. So it's very easy to, when you, when I talk to my students about advocacy, everyone, everyone gets a little nervous and says, I don't understand policy and politics. And I said, you do policy and politics every day. Mm -hmm. You advocate for your patients. So it's, um, nurses are really well suited in the policy and political arena because of our expertise, our training and our natural problem solving skills. You two just, like I said, you, you marry this technology and policy so beautifully. How do you guys know each other? <laughs> well, wait a second. You know, we're neighbors. Um, I don't know how that happens. I mean, I met the Zvenich's at a chili bake-off for our neighborhood. You know what I, we joke, I'm like, I've thought about relocating back to Seattle, which is where I grew up, but it's like, you know, I'm, I'm here for a reason and somehow I, I don't know how we wound up down the street from each other. I feel so fortunate. I'm going to go out on a limb on this one. I think there was a bit of divine intervention. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I, it was real estate, realtor, <laughs> like prowess, you know, or the, the, but I do think that the gods of innovation and problem solving knew that the two of you needed to be as in close proximity as possible. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, uh, we're like the neighborhood power couple. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We have kids around the same age, same energy levels, very physical kiddos. When we're not in a pandemic, they, they call each other family. And so, yeah, I, there must have been divine intervention because I have never had a neighbor like Tracy. That's for <laughs> sure. And <laughs> Tracy gets me into all kinds of trouble. You know, Tracy and I also nerd out on nursing history. Um, we talk to a lot of people also about, you know, Clara Barton and the Red Cross, right? Lillian Wald and the house on Henry Street. These social programs that people, that, that are everyday programs, were created by, led by nurses. If you know the Red Cross, if you know Planned Parenthood, if you know social medicine, these were nursing-led institutions that exist in some, in some form today. And so having a partner in crime like Tracy that in our free time, we think it's fun to talk about the history also of nursing and where we are today. And, and then also how we elevate the nursing practice. I mean, Tracy and I argue really well. Like we spent years speaking our minds to each other. Another thing that I love about our partnership is that it's a spicy partnership. It's not a, no, what, what do you think? And, and how would you do this? And, you know, we have thoughts and we mix thoughts, you know, and, and we're not afraid to make each other uncomfortable sometimes. And I think that that pushes me further than I could ever get on my own. Yeah. And we were talking about things you know, even before COVID-19 and the vision and aspirations that we both held. And then I tricked her and nudged <laughs> aggressively into getting her into more of a leadership role with the Wisconsin Nurses Association. And I said, I'm going to do this. You're a, new, you're a nurse leader. You need to do this too. Um, you have, you know, you have a position that needs to be elevated in our professional associations. And I love that you saw that intersection because I, there oftentimes in, in all types of practices or disciplines that there is this very clear distinction and division between policy and practice. So I love that you did that. Yeah, I don't, there isn't any journal article or study, whether it's bench science or an actual health economics study that I can't put a policy spin to around either increasing access cost or quality of healthcare. Like that is just my, I can, I can see that in everything. And I think that's where Embree sees these things, you know, in our, our approaches to technology and the potential and the, the ways that they can improve healthcare for vulnerable populations and 
when we go at it together, we we cover the ground. (laughs) You mentioned very specifically using policy to keep nurses safe. We have never seen so much injury and death to nurses as a result of caring, of, of practicing. What were your thoughts about policies in place that actually protect nurses and protect all healthcare workers for that matter? It's not exclusive to nurses. Yeah, well, the, you know, the supply chain and distribution of PPE needs to improve further that would be a start. There's also issues around workers' compensation or hazard pay for nurses that are putting their lives and families at risk every day, going to care for patients with COVID-19. There's precedent for disaster relief funds for frontline workers going forward. There are so many policy levers that can be pulled to get nurses what they need, including, we talk about the frontline nurses a lot. There's also a secondary frontline in the community, school nurses are carrying a heavy load in this uh, fight against COVID-19 across the community. There's such a shortage of school nurses, what, one school nurse to every three schools, and the responsibility that they have now to care for the community at large in the context of COVID-19. We could easily advocate for policy to increase the number of school nurses, a nurse for every school, would be a great policy to advocate for and in the fight against COVID-19 and for the future. That's just good policy. Then the last thing that I think a lot about right now is that there is a presidential transition team working and that there is an absence of nurse leaders on the president-elect Biden's COVID-19 task force. And nurses will be the ones to implement those plans And it is a critical voice missing from that decision-making group. And with the recognition that the nursing profession has across our society as the most trusted healthcare profession, Mm -hmm. who would be better to be the voice of the policies and plans that the Biden administration wants to advance? I can't believe it, honestly. I can't believe that there is not a nurse on the COVID-19 task force. Yeah. Nurse disrupted. You have a lot of plans. So, so what's on the horizon? I mean, you, I, I can hear that you have really big ambitious plans and I actually wanted to start from the standpoint of with Tracy, when you think about your clinical partners, because you really have this strategic lens about where nurse disrupted needs to go, the types of problems that need to be solved, and very clear on who those partners need to be. What are you thinking about as far as the strategic design of nurse disrupted and where to go next? Yeah, well, we'll definitely continue to build out our academic partnerships as we serve the homeless community. That is a strategy that is working well and one we plan to continue. I think the other areas that we look forward to advancing in is using the learnings and strengths of the technology that we have deployed with our homeless populations and extending them into other environments and with other types of organizations. And Bree can speak to the technology points, but using the technology to extend the reach of school nurses. If, if a school nurse has assigned to multiple locations, we can use our technology to get them in more places than at once in real time. Mm-hmm. We can do this the same at student health services. And then the other side is with Bree's expertise in technology, she, she creates this vision, but then she actually knows how to do it, which is the most amazing thing that she baffles me every day is that she, she has the vision, then she can actually create the product. And so with the technology and the documentation capabilities that we have, there's going to be a real need for data, documentation, and reporting on COVID-19 for types of organizations that have never had to consider documenting on healthcare-related things now. They need that now and into the future. Mm-hmm. So this is where we are going. And then, as Bree mentioned before, we will then have organizations wired 
and ready to then return back to or rev up chronic disease management. Chronic diseases haven't gone away in, in COVID-19. They've only gotten worse. <laughs> more chronic. So yeah. they've, they've gotten more chronic. And there's a tremendous opportunity to use the technology to address chronic disease management in a holistic and compassionate way today. And we can be doing that for the next 30 years. I want to address something that stands out about Tracy and I versus other pandemic response companies. We're not two MBAs sitting in a room thinking about something that could maybe help or, or be viable. Tracy and I started as solving problems quickly, simply, right? We're in this unique space as entrepreneurs in that we are the nurses who are also using the products and working with the communities. It's not, I've got this idea, here, go guys, and, and take it and run. Both of us use every piece of technology that we deploy. We use the protocols. We teach the students. It is a very different position than having business people think of an idea that they think will make a lot of money and then looking to other people with expertise in that area to deploy it. We are the experts, and I love that. When you think about building Nurse Disrupted, what do you need? What can we do to help you build Nurse Disrupted? We need more volunteers. The more volunteers that we have, so we talk a lot about the academic partnerships, but for our homeless shelters, with the way that we have this, retired nurses who have very much wanted to be in the battle against COVID-19, we can use every single one of them. The more volunteers we have, also we can expand to additional shelters with those resources. Also, we can do more within the shelters that we have. Volunteers will take every single one of you. If you are a nurse leader trying to get your students through their practicums, reach out to us because we have places that need nurses. And if you have nurses who need practicum hours, we know how to make that connection. So you are in business and set for growth. And these are some of the partners and resources and energy and talent that you guys need. There's a lot of a lot of need out there, a lot of a lot of problems that require people's attention to solving. Yeah. Well, thank you for everything that you're doing for our nursing community. And thank you so much for having us. It is just a privilege. Thank you so much. Brie Laughlin is a nurse and self-proclaimed tech nerd with decades of healthcare experience and expertise. Prior to becoming the CEO of Nurse Disrupted, Brie was a nurse executive at Epic Systems Software Company, where she launched five products in eight years with a focus on nursing innovation, mobile solutions, and behavioral health. Nurse and policy wonk, Tracy's Vantage, has a career portfolio that includes clinical care, advocacy, and federal health care policy. Her policy expertise spans the Affordable Care Act, Violence Against Women Act, and Obesity Prevention and Treatment. Tracy is an active member of the Wisconsin Nurses Association, and not surprisingly, holds an elected role as chair of the Public Policy Council. She's also an assistant professor at Georgetown University, where she enthusiastically teaches health policy and advocacy to graduate students in the School of Nursing and Health Studies. Together, Bree and Tracy launched Nurse Disrupted, a pandemic management response company committed to the simplest technology with the biggest impact for vulnerable populations. It was a natural progression for their nursing careers, and it afforded them an opportunity to mix their talents and friendship with compassion, technology, policy, and vision to address society's most pressing healthcare needs. Mixing compassion and technology? Who besides a nurse does that? Increasingly, our healthcare delivery systems and experiences are steeped in technology and driven by data. Health services and education will be delivered virtually and remotely. Embedding compassion in the product build is essential. Designing with an awareness of varying levels of tech literacy and factoring that in to the interaction design is an insight and strength that nurses bring to the gargantuan task of health innovation and transformation. And let's not forget policy. Technology combined with policy changes who does what, when, and where. 
Tracy and Bree personify this notion. When encountering a situation, a problem, an unmet need, they join forces. The technology creating what's possible and the policy protecting what's permissible. And since recording our conversation, some good news, which confirms Tracy's notion that nurses are well suited to advocacy through a concerted effort led by nurses that included writing op-eds, reaching out to journalists, giving interviews, nursing organizations, and nursing political leaders reaching out to the Biden transition team, nurse Jane Hopkins was appointed to the Biden-Harris Coronavirus Task Force, and she brings a wealth of expertise, a range of experience, and compassion to the Biden administration's response to the coronavirus pandemic. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to See You Now wherever you get podcasts. And we'd so appreciate it if you share the show with your friends. It really helps us out. And if you have a moment, drop us a line and let us know what you think of the show. Hello at seeyounowpodcast.com. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance health care for all. Learn more at seeyounowpodcast.com.